Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Levy lecture. I'm Shane Dubow. And um, on behalf of the Levy Senior Center uh, today, uh, Levy Senior Center Foundation, today's guest is Sue Gillen. And she is here to talk to us about everyday improv. And what I mean when I say that is using the techniques of an improv um, theater person in our everyday lives to do things like have stronger relationships, better communication, keep our brains agile. Um, so all these good things. And Sue, uh, Sue Gillen, is my dear friend going all the way back to Evanston High School, 1982. It's when Sue and I first met. Um, Sue is an actress. She is a veteran alum of the Second City um, Improv Comedy Troupe here in Chicago. Um, and uh, in particular, for our purposes today, she's a master improviser. And so she is a great uh, person to go to to learn more about using these improvisational techniques in our everyday lives. Um, before I turn things over to Sue, um, I want to share what I'm going to call a few fun facts about the power of uh, improv, everyday improv, to improve our lives, particularly for um, older adults. Uh, fun fact number one. According to the National Institute of Health, a group of older adults who completed an eight-week improv course in 2021 reported decreased levels of stress, increased levels of relaxation, social integration, and the ability to connect with others. Fun fact number two, um, this is from a, an article in Psychology Today, 2020, another group of older adults, improv uh, classes they took. They reported an improved ability to initiate conversations, build community, and maintain a positive mindset. Fun fact number three, according to a recent article in the National Psychology Journal, um, yet another group of older adults who did some improv classes reported a greater sense of creativity and well-being, as well as a greater ability to tolerate uncertainty. So all that sounds like good stuff. Um, th this last part uh, is not gonna be improv. I have to read a little bit here. Um, this Levy lecture is made possible by the Levy Senior Center Foundation and the city of Evanston. As always, we appreciate your support um, of the foundation as we continue working to connect our community of older adults. Okay, without further ado, turning it over to Sue Gillen. Beautiful. Thank you, Shane Dubow. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us here today. Uh, I think that what Shane said that stands out to me the most is that um, the goals for today are about strengthening relationships, sparking connection, and maintaining cognitive ability, adaptability, resilience as we get older. So um, for today's session, the next hour, we're going to do some facilitated conversations. Um, and I will facilitate those conversations. The folks that you see here on this screen are terrific volunteers who are willing to participate in these improvised conversations. And we're also going to utilize the chat because it's really important to me that you in this audience are participating just like the audience at an improv show. Improv shows are created by audience participation and suggestion. And that's what we're going to be doing here today. So I'd like for all of you to take a second and on your screen, toward the bottom of the screen where you see mute and stop video, you see where it says chat. I want you to click on the chat and on the right side of the screen, you should be able to see the chat and you should be able to type a message into the chat that all of us can see. And, and that way, when I come to you for suggestions, insights, questions, hi, Dolly, uh, then we can see what you have to say. So 
I want to start utilizing the chat this very minute. Um, how many of you uh, can give me a definition of improv? What is improv? Just a couple of words, throw them in the chat. Improv is what? Funny. Sometimes it is. Yes, when we're lucky. On the spot. Spontaneous. Yes, I love this. Yes, and. Beautiful. Scriptless. Yes. Immediate funny response. Sometimes funny. Yes. The power of yes and being in the moment. Take what you're given and respond in a flexible, creative way. Coming up with something off the top of your head. Thinking on your feet. Okay, first of all, give yourselves a round of applause. All of us who you can see on screen, go ahead and clap. I like applause a lot. Come on now. There it is. Give it up. I also like snapping. The kids snap. And I like that. Uh, so yes, being on your toes. I love this. So improvisation is the art of making something from nothing together without a script, without a plan. And that can be extremely scary. <laughs> uh, but all of you are improvising every minute of every day. Anytime that you come into connection with someone else, you're improvising. And um, sometimes that can be a little overwhelming. As we get older, we lose close family members. We lose close friends. Sometimes our friends change due to um, dementia, due to physical pain, due to depression, or simply due to the fact that they're different now than they were when you started being friends with them 25, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and I see even our volunteers here, a little bit of that nodding. So mm -hmm. I am uh, I am here today to just provide you um, with some tools to be able to observe yourself as a communicator and to lay a toolkit at your feet. And so you can start to choose if there are tools in that toolkit that would help you in your own communication style to more easily strengthen relationships, spark some new connections, and really develop more of that necessary agility and adaptability. So the first thing I want to do, this is going to be an all play. So everybody who uh, can hear my voice, grab a pen and a piece of paper. Or you can just type it on your phone like the kids do. <laughs> and I am going to ask you to complete the following statement. I appreciate communication that is blank, blank, and blank. I appreciate communication that is blank, blank, and blank. So you're going to list three things. I appreciate it, communication that is this, that, that and the other. And I'm going to shut up and give you 30 seconds to complete that. Beautiful. Wrap those up. And oh, I see Victoria, Sylvia, Ms. Coles. You are all ahead of me on this because I love that you're starting to throw this into the chat. And we can see in the chat, I appreciate communication that is clear, concise, and direct. Clear, concise, creative. Wow, we get a lot of clear and concise, y'all. They're telling us to heighten and tighten, as we say in the biz. Relevant, open, friendly, kind, timely, understandable, empathetic. These are beautiful. Just keep throwing them in there. Now, why? Why is it meaningful to know your own communication preferences? 
And somebody here who I can see on my screen, feel free to unmute if you have a thought about that. Why is it helpful if I know my own communication preferences? Those are all great, one more. It's something about uh, being ready to understand someone else's preferences. I mean, Penny, I'm if giving I you a right recognize mine. Yes. When we are thoughtful about our own, that self-awareness, it means that I have the ability to be aware of what works for other people around me. So I need to know my own communication preferences and weaknesses so that I have my best shot at connecting with the people who I could have a great friendship with a great working relationship with, a great living situation with. So the more I know about your communication style and the more I know about mine, the faster we can make a connection and the deeper we can make a, a connection. So, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. gonna have different things that they prefer. Mine, I love transparent communication. I don't want to solve a mystery. Thank you. Next. <laughs> uh, I love kindness. Like why, if you're going to be a super crab, I'm going to take my goodies elsewhere and go find somebody else to connect with. And I like communication that is in its nature, a little playful. So I, I take my work seriously. I take my friendship seriously and I like to play. And I am very happy when I'm around other people who are a little bit playful. So you have this beautiful gift now of listing for yourselves the things that are really meaningful to you as a communicator. It just makes it that much easier to get out in the world and start deciding more definitively, is this person a fit for me? And if not, it's okay, but I gotta keep it pushing and I gotta keep trying to make those connections. So I appreciate that all play very much. Uh, and now what I want to do is focus on two of our volunteers and David and Penny, because you're sitting next to each other and you're in the middle of my screen, I'm going to invite you to do our first um, experiential improv exercise. So usually improv is done in a theater and it's done for comedy and it's done in front of drunk people. Um, today, I'm gonna be distilling the essence of improv, which is what are some of the agreements that we improvisers need to make in order to successfully make something out of nothing? We don't have a script, but we do have some agreed upon rules of engagement. And so I'm gonna share the first one with you is something that we call thank you. So Penny, I'm gonna ask you to just start a conversation with David. It can be about the weather. It can be about the place you'd like to go on vacation next, but you're just gonna say one sentence at a time. And each sentence that Penny says, David, you're gonna respond but I want each response to begin with the words, thank you. And so then it'll go back to Penny. Your response will begin with thank you. So Shane, let's you and I model that really quick. Unmute for me, will you? Hi, Beautiful. Sue. Thank you. Hi, Shane, how's today? Thanks, Sue. Today is wonderful. I'm looking out uh, at a lake in central Indiana where I've come to watch the eclipse. Thank you. Ooh, eclipses are exciting. Did you wear glasses? Sue, thanks so much for asking. Um, please. I so didn't. Please, I want you to start each response with the words thank you. Each response with the words thank you. Okay, David and Penny, you got it? I understand. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Take it away, Penny. Um, what did you think of how the eclipse? Thank you. 
No, you have to begin with thank you. Oh, thank you. I had fun setting up the equipment. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, that was some fascinating equipment that you made, a cardboard box with a hole in it. Well, thank you for asking. It intrigued one of our neighbors who came by and asked if she could help. And when I showed her, she looked at the eclipse, uh, the machine and said, could she take a picture? <laughs> thank you. You mean she wanted, she had her camera handy for, for photographing eclipses? <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, she had her, I don't know why she had it handy, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she took a picture of the equipment and the little tiny images that it made. Thank you. Thank you. How big were the images? They were, thank you. Uh, they were about this big. Beautiful. Give yourselves a round of applause. Excellent. Okay. So in the chat, Penny and David, thank you for doing that modeling. You are going to notice that a lot of what I'm laying on your conversations makes your conversations clunky, awkward, weird. Bear with me. Folks in the chat, in the audience, what are some observations you have about the influence of adding thank you to their conversation? Any observations at all? They smiled, felt kind and welcoming. Love these. They got more open. Yes, nice the first time. It was unnatural for sure. <laughs> Added a little moment of respect. It does slow down the real thought, slower pace. Yes, giving them time to respond, giving them pause to think, I love these. The pleasantry that lubricates the conversation, Sylvia, I love it, forces you to listen, Mike. I go. Oh. And Ms. Coles keeps popping in, in all caps, and I love you, Ms. Coles. So yes, it shows appreciation. Okay, all of these things are true. As an improviser, we already know that I have nothing at my disposal. I don't have a set. I don't have a prop. I, I don't have a costume. I don't have a script. I only have the other people in my ensemble. And so... If I am in front of 300 people and the audience is clapping and they're ready for the show to begin, if I step forward, okay, now I'm out here by myself. Everybody else is safely on the back line. I'm out here by myself and I say, it looks like it's going to rain. All I want is for someone else to get the hell out here and say something. I just want some support. So I care less about what they say and I care a lot that they're willing to take the risk to come forward and partner with me to build something. And conversations, even though on the stage in front of 300 people, it's on this macro stress level. <laughs> Even in conversation one-on-one, -on -one, we can feel that stress of, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to be included and accepted? If you are the type of communicator who comes to each interaction with a spirit of thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for telling me that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. We're certainly not gonna say thank you every time we talk or we would be committed to a place. Uh, yeah, we have an inherent thank you in all of our communication. And this tool, can be exceptionally useful when we're hearing information that might be difficult for someone to bring to us. So if somebody brings me some information that I don't really want to hear, that's either painful or stressful or frustrating, 
if I can still convey that open willingness to hear the thank you. And in that instance, it's, it really is a thank you. I'm sure that was hard for you to bring to me. Uh, <laughs> that still, if I don't blow a gasket, if I don't lose my cool, if I don't start immediately blaming, how could you bring me that information? If I can just hang in there through that first wave of stress, setting that calm for myself also teaches that person that I'm trustworthy. I'm teaching you that you can trust me. I'm showing you, I'm not telling you. And, and I think it also brings up this really important distinction. Uh, difficult topics don't have to lead to difficult conversations. Those are two different things. Shane and I can have a discussion about a very difficult topic. If I come to him with an open communication style, and if he has that inherent thank you, no matter how challenging the information is, no matter how sticky the topic, we have a great shot at navigating that without making it personal, without adding to the difficulty. Does that make sense? The difference between a difficult conversation and a conversation about a difficult topic? Mm -hmm. My buddies in the chat, help me identify some, what are some of the dynamics, some of the relationships in your life where that tool of an inherent thank you in my communication style. Where could that be helpful to you, if anywhere? Put her in the chart. On a condo board, you have no idea. Oh my God, my dad knows. I had, I really did use that tool this week. With my siblings, yes. Oh my gosh, family dynamics, especially the old ones. Talking to my grown children, Mike Myers all day. Navigating how much time my husband and I spend together. Yes, all these negotiations, navigating, negotiating. Oh, that is so beautiful. So instead of saying, what do you mean? I love this. Miss Coles, every time you yell in your all caps, I'm so happy. I was raised to have the attitude of gratitude. And I can tell that. And I appreciate that. My adult daughter, Enid. Yes, I've been that adult daughter. Uh, this could be helpful with all my friends who have different political views. Guys, it's an election year. Yes, this is where we're these um, improv, adaptable, flexible communication skills. Man, do they make us useful inside of every group we're a part of. And we're all a part of a lot of different groups. I begin every email with thank you. It does make a difference. Sylvia, I love that. Yes. So this attitude of gratitude. And again, you don't need to say it all the time, but I have found after 30 years of being an improviser, I do say thank you a lot and I mean it a lot. It's not some BS crank up the hot gratitude machine. I have found that practicing these skills make me more grateful. Practicing these skills make me more open. Um, I can't think my way into behaving differently. I need to behave my way into thinking differently. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay. Oh, I like you guys so much. Thank you for sharing. You, I'm never going to stop talking about Miss Coles because I can't get enough of it. Uh, okay, so congratulations. That was a beautiful first exercise. And now we're going to move on to the second exercise, which is called Yes And. This is a cornerstone of improvisation. And I need three people who are going to participate in this exercise. Cynthia, I love that you raised your hand. Do you have a question? Uh, go ahead and unmute for me, Cynthia. 
I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you say what this exercise is about. Uh, it's called Yes And, and no one knows. Yes what And. It is. Oh, okay. Yes And. Okay. Yes. So we're going to get there. Do you want to um, be one of my volunteers for this, Cynthia? Beautiful. So go ahead and unmute. I, I know. That, thank you so much. You and John are in the same room. So I'm going to have you two uh, be two of my volunteers. And I need one more. Rebecca, were you raising your hand? Oh, I love this. Great. So yes Cynthia. And. Hi. Yes, and like yes, but. Oh, I mean, first of all, I feel or are they like quite different? They are quite different, but I love that you're already like, what else would follow yes? that, And um, so that is part of the exercise. Great news, John. And what I'd love to have you do is, uh, Cynthia, you're going to be person A. John, you are person B. Rebecca, you are person C. And what the three of you are going to be doing together in the next 90 seconds is improvising a plant. Yes, aunt. I just saw that from Ruth. I mean, it might be in your family, but it is yes and for our purposes right now. Uh, Cynthia, John, Rebecca, you are going to be planning a party. So this Levy lecture series has been so successful that one year from now, we're gonna get together and we're gonna throw a huge celebratory party. What you are going to do is throw out suggestions for a party. And Cynthia, you are person A. So you're going to be the first person who is generating ideas for a party, okay? I want you to just generate one after the other. We could throw a puppy party. We could throw a roller skating party. We could throw a party with cupcakes filled with jelly beans. You're just going to generate party ideas. John and Rebecca, you are going to take turns with each idea that Cynthia throws out, you are going to respond with statements, starting with the words, no, I think, and then fill in the rest of that sentence. So Shane, you're gonna model with me real quick, unmute. I'm gonna pitch ideas, and each response that you give me is gonna begin with no, I think. So it's gonna sound like this. I think we should have a no shoes party. No, I think, um, you know, I have really ugly toenails and I, it's not for me. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll have a skateboard party and we'll give everybody a skateboard on the way in. No, I, I think uh, me and Matt Reed in the in the 70s, we crashed skateboards and it was bloody and it okay, ruined no a birthday problem, party. No problem, no problem, no problem. We're going to have a pool party. We're going to go swimming. No, I, I'm a, I just am really afraid of the people that can't swim. There's a lot of liability issues to consider. Beautiful. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> Cynthia, you see how you're just going to generate party ideas. And then John and Rebecca are going to alternate with no, I think, responses to your ideas. Ready? Go. I think we should have a party where everyone dresses as their favorite movie character. Uh, no, I think... I think some of my favorite movie characters wear some very strange clothing, and, and I don't know that I'd be able to get a hold of that stuff. Rebecca? Whoops. Oh, does Cynthia go or do I go? Either one. Cynthia, oh. throw out another idea, Cynthia, and then Rebecca will. Okay. Say All right, then. Um, what about a party where everyone dresses as their favorite animal? No, I think that would be bad because I hate cats. Oh, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> I think we should have a party where everyone wears a silly hat. I'm trying to go through my closet. And John, I want you to start each response with no, I think. No, I, I think most of the hats in my closet are very conservative and not silly at all. I'd have to go hunting for a silly hat somewhere, probably at a silly hat store. I think we should have a party with mismatched socks. No, I think that would be bad because, you know, some people's feet smell, smell bad. <laughs> I think we should have a party... Um, 
to have a party with all different kinds of flowers with wonderful scents. No, I, I think that those flower scents are going to mix all up and then they're going to smell like the Nordstrom perfume counter or something. And give yourselves a round of a party. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, <laughs> that was expertly executed. Before we discuss that round, I want to move right away into round two. So person B, that's you, John. It is now your turn to host a brilliant party and to come up with a million brilliant party ideas. And Cynthia and Rebecca are going to alternate with responses beginning with the words, yes, but, yes, but. And those need to be statements. So Shane, yes, let's but. model that really quick. Go ahead and unmute for me. Uh, I think we should have a light your hair on fire party. Why don't Yes, but um, I have so much product in my hair, Sue. I'm worried that it's really going to get out of control and we're going to have a five alarm situation going on. Okay, okay. So let's have a slumber party where everybody sleeps for a week. We'll give out sleeping pills. Yeah, but you know, with the sleeping pills and the Ambien and sometimes you eat in the middle of the night. I once cooked ribs and I was in a blackout. I didn't remember. Got it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So you understand, <laughs> yes, but... John, go ahead and start pitching party ideas. I'm telling you, summer's coming. I think we ought to have a bathing suit party. Yes, but, you know, bathing suits are very expensive these days. Yes, but beautiful. John, pitch another one. Um, I think we should have a table tennis party without the tables and just play table tennis on the floor. Yes, but I have such a hard time getting up and down from the floor. <laughs> John? Okay, yeah, then how about a party with a table tennis party using the ceiling? Would that be easier? Yes, but um, only Fred Astaire could do that in the movies. I know. Let's have a house cleaning party. Our house is filthy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but but nobody would come. <laughs> okay, let's let's have a party of dentistry stories where <laughs> everybody brings a story of his recent visit to the dentist. Yes, but that's going to be so painful. Some people will cry. Um, let's have a party where everybody brings something interesting to sell to somebody else at the party. Yes, but I, I don't have anything to sell. Beautiful. Give yourselves a round of applause. Oh, I love this so much. I mean, first of all, let me just say, those are some amazing party ideas. <laughs> uh, now, before I ask everyone in our audience, I want to ask Cynthia and John, what was your experience? And I'll start with you, Cynthia, of having all of your ideas met with no, I think. Tell me about that. Um, well, let's see, it just, you have to be creative to get around that. You know, that's what I thought. Um, it, um, I guess I was very aware that we're role playing and I just thought a lot of it was very funny, you know? So, um, I, I, I didn't study method acting, so... <laughs> <laughs> what so did I, you I, find um so one thing you noted which i think is really important is that you had to be really creative and i want to say that another way i want to say that the burden of being really creative was totally on you so you had to generate every new idea the person who was saying no was able to just sit back and shoot it down. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, which is a much 
um, more passive way to be. So, okay, so that's no, I think. John and Rebecca, when you were saying no, I think, what was your experience like being the person who had to say no all the time? Well, I, I didn't think that it was constructive to say no all the time. I've been in situations where uh, people have tried to propose an activity or or uh, let's go to see a movie or let's go to this restaurant or the other. And if everybody in the room says no, pretty soon you get kind of frustrated with the people in the room. You, 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 you've got to do everything and they, nobody's going along. Um, oh, John, you really, what an insight that if you're the person who's offering up ideas and those ideas are always met with no, it's demoralizing and yeah, frustrating. Yeah. And, and, and what happens, Rebecca, if you hear no enough, what's your instinct? Well, oh, my instinct is to kind of quit. I mean, quit giving ideas, I guess. Um, and, and no one would blame you. Eventually, you're going to give up. And that's a big bummer because we don't want each other to give up coming up with ideas or creative solutions or new ways of approaching challenges. Um, okay, so now I wanna talk really quickly about um, the, the but. Yes, but. John, what, what was your experience of having all of your ideas, yes, but, Id? Well, again, it was discouraging, and and um, I was expecting at least a partial affirmation of one of my ideas uh, that somebody would say that's a good idea for a party, ping pong balls. Well, we'll use tennis balls instead, or something else. But I didn't get that, and so I I was looking for a uh, an addition to the idea. Oh, I love rather, that. Rather than a rejection of the idea. Yes. So I think that this, sometimes we can trick ourselves into thinking, yes, but. And like, I'm saying yes. I said yes. But I'm bringing us back to reality, which is that's impossible or that won't be fun or like, um, yes, but. And Sharon, I don't know if I'm saying your name exactly right. It might be Sharon. Either way, beautiful name. Uh, yes, but still is a negative response and and shuts everything down. Yeah. So that is super important to know. And okay, we're gonna do one last quick round. Rebecca, it's your turn to throw a party. Okay. And Cynthia and John are going to alternate. And this round is gonna go faster. So Rebecca, you're gonna throw out an idea. Cynthia, you're gonna set, uh, each response will begin with yes and, and then John, you're gonna follow Cynthia, yes and. And you're just gonna build like that. Ready, Rebecca, go. Uh, let's have a party on the beach. And we could bring our dog, yes, and we could bring our dogs too. And then we can have big balloons that we float in the sky. Yes and. Yes, and we can tease the lifeguard. Yes, and, and maybe kites too. Kites are a lot of fun at the beach. Yeah, and, and then we can um uh, uh start a fire. Yes, and we can build sand castles. A fire, that means marshmallows. You gotta have marshmallows with fire. Yes, and oh yes, and sorry. Yes, and, and we, we can bring uh, marshmallows and uh, graham crackers and uh, chocolate. Or we could have the uh, uh, a party at the History Museum. Yes, and Rebecca. Oh, yes, and, and we could also have a, a party at the History Museum. Yes, and well, we should bring a boom box. Beautiful, give yourselves yes, a round of applause. Yes, and we could we could also bring our favorite history books, which I'm sure would be a 
big party which similar leaders. Absolutely. A history book is always a great beach party accelerator. At the very <laughs> least, you can throw it on the fire and bonfire. <laughs> so that's beautifully done. Round of applause. You know how I feel about applause. I like it. Okay. So this round, this time I'm going to go direct to the audience. Um, what did you notice was different about this round? when we used yes and as a tool. More energy, yes, for sure. More ideas generated. We got somewhere, it was positive, it was fun. Leads to uh, effusiveness and effervescence. I love this linguist. Rebecca's smiling fates, yes, the energy changes. We're building on each other's ideas. People are more open, more creative, so helpful and fun, I'm laughing. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask you in the audience, why do you think people are more open and having more fun in this world where yes and is the driver? What changed in that environment? Yes, they're feeling affirmed. They're feeling supported, trust. Okay, who is this? Victoria, I'm gonna come out there and give you a big smooch on your cheek because trust is the key. Richard, you're making me laugh. How do you yes and when the original idea is a stinker? Great news, Richard. In the world of imagination, there ain't no stinkers. Now, if somebody is saying to you, and I love this question, if in real life, someone says, I think we should go have a walk on broken glass party, which probably won't happen, Richard. But let's just say somebody proposes something that you really don't want to do. There is a way to use this yes and tool to ensure that you're able to take care of yourself. I will not be walking on glass. And you're able to keep the connection with that person. So when I think of yes and as an improviser, it's so important to know, note that the yes is about acknowledgement, not necessarily acceptance. Acknowledgement, not necessarily acceptance. So what does that mean? Yes, Shane, I hear that you want me to hold your hand and walk on broken glass because you think it's going to really be great. And um, I hear you. I hear that you are way into that. And I love that for you. And I'm not comfortable being on glass with my shoes off. What I'd love to do is join you uh, in a walk on this nice green patch of lawn. Are you up for that? So I think it is a great question, Richard, uh, that even if someone is suggesting something to me, and this just happened in my own life recently, and John, you said it, that if you make a suggestion to go to a movie, my husband said to me, oh, I wanna go to um, the Music Box Theater. And I had spent the day before, I had to sit a lot for one of my um, jobs. And I knew I couldn't sit through a whole movie. And I still loved that I was asked. I was able to say to him, oh, I wish I could see that movie. That's a movie that I've been dying to see. And I might need to wait until next week or at least a couple of days before I can sit in a theater again. I didn't say, I can't believe you're asking me this when you know I was sitting a lot yesterday and my neck really hurts. I didn't say like, well, it must be nice for you to get to go to a movie because your neck isn't bothering you. Like I didn't have to say any of that. I can acknowledge I got a great invitation. Thank you for that invitation. And it's not quite a fit for me today. Here's what we could potentially do instead. Yes, and one idea at a time. And again, when I become the type of communicator who's aware 
of my own communication, I have less chance of hurting someone's feelings, making them feel like um, I don't like their ideas. And it's so important for me to maintain those open lines of communication because I want them to keep sharing their ideas with me. And we all just said here, if somebody meets me with no, eventually I'm gonna do this, bye. And I ain't coming back. So I think we've all experienced the no but people in our lives. And I don't know about y'all, but I tend to put some loving distance between myself and the no butters and then get busy finding the yes anders. But I have to be one of those people in order to attract more of those people. And I think especially, you know, Judy and I were talking before this session started about how as we get older, so many of our loved ones change. Um, I think specifically through dementia, illness, um, mental health challenges, the person that we knew is changing. And I can either know but that, or I can yes and that. Because all I'm doing when I'm yes anding is acknowledging reality and offering what I can. And there are times when circumstances are such that no matter how much I try, I'm not going to be able to make anybody happier, different. What I can do is keep my own spirit of thank you and yes and alive. And I can use that yes and tool to start building new relationships or renewed relationships in my life. I hadn't seen Shane in a long time before he reached out about this. And it's amazing how quickly we can pick back up because Shane has never stopped growing and changing and yes anding. And it allows us to pick up where we left off and then build on that foundation of friendship. So Sylvia says here, sometimes a no but is an indication that the other person is not listening to you. Rather, they were waiting for their turn to say something. Oh, Sylvia, what an insight. I like to call that listening to understand rather than listening to respond. And yes, and gives me more time to listen. Remember how you all noted in the thank you exercise that the beauty of thank you, one of the beautiful things, is it slowed us down. When I slow down, I'm indicating to you that I'm listening. And when you know I'm listening, you naturally are going to trust me more and our relationship can deepen. I read recently um, one of those little factoids that, um, and it was in Forbes that said it takes 55 hours to develop a friendship, a real friendship. It takes 200 hours to develop a really close friendship. I believe that with when I'm really utilizing these improv tools, the road to deeper relationships is faster. Part of it is because, honestly, I don't try to convince no but people to come on over to the yes and world. Live and let live. What I really do is find the people who are willing to try it on, listening, building ideas together, acknowledging, thanking. Those are the people that I really love to be around. Um, so I just offer that to you because so many of you 
are in this position of having to renew friendships or start brand new friendships. When you lose the people who have been your lifelongs, spouses, siblings, friends, it is a time in life where the circle can get perilously small. And a good friend of mine always says to me, the goal, Sue, is to keep pushing the circle out. Push the circle out. It is unnatural. It is sometimes uncomfortable. But the benefits are such good goodies. And it's much easier than I think. Pushing the circle out. Are there any observations or questions on that in the chat before I move on? Sometimes for my aging dad, no but comes from a place of being uncomfortable with his new limitations. Yes. Tal, that is A, an extremely generous, true observation. If I can look at the why behind someone's no but, I can be a more empathetic partner, friend, daughter. And I hear you. Yeah. And I still think that when I am modeling, yes, and the likelihood that people around me are going to start to model that too goes way up. So if I'm being met with no but, the last thing I want to do is start fighting. What does push the circle out mean? So we, you know, have a, a circle of people in our lives, our friends, our family, um, our neighbors, uh, people in our senior community, that, those are the folks in our circle. And as we get older, naturally, the circle starts to shrink. We're not working anymore. We're often not starting new hobbies. We don't have kids in common. Um, and so our circle gets smaller. And what I'm offering to you is that pushing that circle out, that's a huge part of um, staying mentally agile and um, engaged, and that helps our mental health so much. It helps us spark connections and deepen relationships. So Ms. Coles, does that make sense to you? I bet it does. I'm going to get a yes pretty soon here. Okay. So uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, okay. Beautiful. So any other questions, observations? Okay, I just want to do one more exercise and then we can move into um, any Q&A or I don't know, I wish we could all do a show together. Here is my next exercise. Now I'm cutting things really quickly. Oh, uh, this is a fun one. This is called Apologize Interrupt. John Gillen and Karen Erickson, will you please model for me um, this next exercise? So here's what's going to happen. John Gillen, you are going to tell a story and this story can be real, something that's happened in the last couple of days or made up. Um, and Karen, you're gonna let John Gillen talk, you know, throw out a sentence or two of his story. And then you're going to interrupt him. And then you're going to quickly apologize and then John Gillen, you're going to pick up where you left off. So Shane, we're going to model this. Um, it might sound something like this. Shane, just make up a story about something that happened in your day. And I'm going to model how we're going to interrupt, apologize, and keep it moving. So I'm walking the dog. and oh, we're you have past... a dog. Oh, I, oops. Sorry. Go on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so like uh, it's a small dog, a 20-pound dog. And Oh, I'm... my gosh. I'm so glad because big dogs are the – oh, sorry. Go ahead. And uh, and and so this other dog comes to the fence, and they're barking at each other. And you that know, because I have, have a... been terrified. Oh, sorry. Go on. Wait, I can't. I can't remember where okay. I was going. So with thank this. you so much. Beautiful. Uh, so John Gillen, just give us a story. Go ahead and unmute yourself, and Karen, unmute yourself, and. Whenever you're ready, John, start your story. And Karen, go ahead and jump in aggressively. Go for it. Well, I was going to tell a story about jogging. 
but somebody stepped I go on my. I get up every morning. I go. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, as as I'm saying, I was tell a story about shouting, but somebody stepped on my story with their story about walking the dog. Walking the but dog. Let me get back walking to my dog. Jogging. I heard a story about. I walk, I oh, went I'm jogging. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Well, uh, it dawned on me as I started jogging. You know, I hadn't really jogged since the. Oh, I know. I haven't jogged. So in I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Wait a minute. I, I stole. I'm sorry. So I slowed way, way down. And I was going so slow. Don't you that find that when you're going woman really behind slow that it's like started, oh, wait a minute. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, any, anyway. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was so funny that I am crying. Uh now, John Gillen. Tell me a little bit about what did you have to do each time you were interrupted? <clears throat> well, I had to collect my thoughts such as they are and start anew. So uh, it was it was a series of starting a story. Yes. First, I started a story and it, it was like a chapter. And then I got interrupted. So I got back to halfway through the first chapter. And I got halfway through the second chapter and then I got interrupted, so forth and so on. Yes, and that is a really good analogy. It's like if you're reading a book and somebody comes up and shuts the book and you're like, oh God, okay. Now I've got to get back, not just to the page, but what was the paragraph? What, where was I? And I think um, you saw that it really impedes the progress of the story. Karen, I want you to tell me what are some um, what are some reasons that you think people might interrupt? They're not listening. They're thinking about what they want to say instead. Um, they want to jump in, they, they want to share, but they don't allow the other person to finish their thought. That um, is so right there. You gave us three very common and very real reasons. Hey, audience out there. Uh, what are some other reasons that people interrupt? Throw them in the chat. Nervousness, they want the power. They're bored with you. Narcissism, <laughs> they're excited to chime in. Genesis, that's a very generous one. They're trying to make a connection. Yes, Kathy, yes. Okay, so what I'm seeing here already is that there are all different reasons that people interrupt. Some of them are because we're kind of self-centered by nature. Oh, I want to talk about me. Some of them are because they're excited and they want to connect. You're talking about a French class you took. I took a French class. We can be friends. I know about this thing too. Um, and, oh God, Linda, this one is so true too. Afraid they're going to forget what they want to say. And as we get older, yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to forget. So I'm just going to jump in. And sometimes I want to be like, ooh, ooh, before I forget. Uh, so there are good reasons. There's not so great reasons. There's all different kinds of reasons for interruptions. What we know for sure is that interruptions are hard on the person who's being interrupted. How, uh, what are some ways of avoiding interruption? Let's think about that. Is there a way? Stick it in the chat if you have an idea. 
ignore them. Oh, Mike. <laughs> Just bulldoze, man. Uh, yeah, okay. When a, a person can ask for feedback, I love it. Write it down. Lindy, you're my new best friend. Patient, active listening. Miss Coles, all caps, all day. Enid, I love, let me finish, please. Jody, just cut to, I am talking. Some people, Tal, say whiteboard this, but that is actually already interrupting. True, true. Okay, so here's what I'm going to offer to you. As an improviser, going back to improv, we believe that the burden of communication is on the sender. The burden of communication is on the sender. So if I have a story to tell you, the first thing I tend to do when I want to tell somebody something is I will ask, do you have seven minutes? Like I literally, when I call people, I start by asking for the amount of time I need. Do you have two minutes? Hi, this is Sue. I have a story to tell you. Do you have five minutes? Hi, this is Sue. Uh, I just need 30 seconds, quick check. So if I tell someone a little bit about what this communication is going to require from them. The kinds of improviser friends I have tend to say to me, ooh, I don't have seven minutes now, but I'll have seven minutes at four o'clock. Can you talk then? Yes, great, high five, peace. It is so important to remember that we're communicating all day long and often we forget to communicate about how we're going to communicate. I'm going to say that again. We want to communicate about how we're going to communicate. It's going to make things so much smoother. So if I say to you, Shane, I have the wildest story to tell you, but it's going to take me seven minutes. Do you have time for that now? I always have seven minutes of time for you, Sue. Literally always? Oh my God, I want your life. Okay, here it goes. Uh, then Shane doesn't need to interrupt me. What happens if I call him up and just start in with Shane? Oh my God. So the weirdest thing happened. I was walking down my street. There was this crazy huge dog and you're not going to believe it. A pony was behind the dog. Yeah. Like being led on a leash. Eventually he's going to have to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Hang on. Freeze. I'm at the DMV. And you're on speaker. Like, we want to make sure that I'm communicating about what I need from him. And Francine, Francine Markwell, Francine Markwell from Harrison Street. In discussions, group has a facilitator who listens and discreetly, discreetly says, thank you. yes, that's true. hundred uh, percent. Hi, Francine. Say hi to Scotty and Howie. Um, okay, so I really love this idea. Personal pet peeve, people who call me and just launch into a monologue without asking me if it's a good time to talk. True. Now, what I will say is that there are times when I need to interrupt people. Like, we are people. That happens. I, when I need to do that, I always start with these words. I apologize. I need to interrupt you right here. That is, it's that simple. I'm going to interrupt you. My apology. I'm in the middle of A, B, and C. I have a dear friend, one of my longest, loveliest friends who cannot not launch. She only ever calls me and is like, girl, get ready. And I'm like, freeze, freeze. <laughs> I'm so excited to hear it. And I can't hear it right now. Let's talk at blah, blah, blah. And, and that's fine. But what we're trying to do in these exchanges, we're trying to keep the connection. So I don't want to be like, forget that friend. She always interrupts me or, you know, forget. Like I can manage some of the communication if I know that my friendship is really worth it. I mean, I love my friend, Jen. She's just never going to not launch. So she has learned that when I say to her, oh my gosh, I'm, I'd love to hear this. I cannot right now. I'm going to have to hang up. She just goes, okay, bye. <laughs> Fine. No harm, no foul. Uh, so 
okay, I've got the seven minutes, but then the story goes all over the map. What do you do? Richard, I love this question. You acknowledge that. So here, I've got this seven minutes and this thing has now gone wild and it's over seven minutes. I just need to say, hang on one second. I'm going to interrupt you. I understood we, we had a seven minute story and I don't have more than that. So I'm going to have to hop off now and we'll catch up later. And if it's a, if the person is incapable of telling a seven minute story, you'll know that, Richard. And I trust that you will use yes and to get out of that situation. So for example, I'm going to have to hop off. I thought that this was going to be a seven minute conversation. If the person then says, well, it turns out my story's longer than seven minutes and I'm dying to tell you this. I hear you. I can tell that you're excited about it. Now is not going to be the time for me. Let's catch up later. I'm going to hang up now. Talk soon. Click. I told the person what I'm doing. All good. All fine. And if somebody ends up being mad about that, you can always come back to the fact that, oh, I thought we agreed on seven minutes. And when we went out of those parameters, I had to take my time back. But I certainly wasn't mad. I just had to go ahead and take my time back. The end. So you might find with some people in your lives that you don't want to keep that connection. And that's okay too. Even in those situations, I can use yes and. Yes, I know you wish we spent more time together and it's just not possible for me to add more to my schedule right now. That's it. So I'm positive, I'm honest, and I'm protecting myself, even when there might be folks yes. that aren't the best. Yeah, I'm still on. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a panelist. Okay. Uh, it is now 2.40. So uh, any questions or comments about what we've done, throw them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, the experiential part of this session is adjourned, and I want to give a huge round of applause to Richard, Rebecca, John Gillen, Karen, David, Penny, Cynthia, and John. Yes, 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 yes. Not Thank you. I'm interrupting. Thank no, you, you, Sue Gillen. Um, thank you, panelists. And thank you, audience. We are not quite done. If you could hang out for a little bit longer, I wanted to give, just sort of open it up for general Q&A um, about anything you've seen here today, anything, questions you might have for Sue. I definitely have a couple of personal questions I'm dying to ask Sue. Um, uh, so I'm going to give you t a little bit of time to fill up the chat. We're going to, um, let's say like we do this for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and while you're filling up the chat, I'm going to kick it off with Sue. Since I first met you in 1982, you were, um, you have always been um, uh, theatrical. You've always had like an aspect of you that um, was very comfortable um, in front of others, um, very comfortable uh, being dynamic, performative. What is the first kind of earliest moment you can remember kind of taking to that, that that felt good to you? Uh, I grew up on a street with a lot of kids my age and specifically a lot of little girls. So from the time I was, you know, four years old, there was like a built-in audience <laughs> of other little girls who loved to play. And we did a lot of amazing stuff on Harrison Street. We started a little school for teaching little kids how to read. We um, had dance classes. We, we... It wasn't just me. I think um, I loved being part of an ensemble from the time I was a very little girl. I remember in 1976, my dad, John Gillen, built us 
um, a very like one foot off the ground balance beam the year of the 1976 Olympics. And on our street, we girls pulled together and had the Harrison Street Olympics. So I think I was drawn to collaboration and group creativity from the jump. I'm not a person who has ever sat in a corner and written an opera by myself. I like making up stuff with other kids, now adults. So in a way you sort of, you discovered organically sort of the model, the improv model that you would later do professionally when did you when did you discover it in the professional realm? When did you discover improv um, as a performer? When I was in high school, I remember vividly going to the Second City for the first time and realizing by the end of that show, okay, that's a job. I want that job. That's the job I want. So I didn't grow up feeling like... Um, I want to be a stand-up comedian or like I saw what was happening at Second City and knew I would get my butt on that stage if it took forever. And it did take a long time. It took rejections and I, I couldn't even get into classes at first, uh, which helped me build a lot of resiliency. Um, now, Sue, I know that um, a big part of your job is kind of sort of like doing what you did here with us today, which is taking some of these improv principles and transporting them into different realms off stage. Um, how does that how has that worked for you in in the business world? I know you've done a lot of um, work with advertising agencies. How have you been using this model in kind of these other realms? I mean, I think that you have all just proven that applied improvisation works in any realm where collaborative communication and collaborative creative problem solving is necessary. So I've had the privilege of doing improv-based communication and leadership workshops for so many different kinds of groups, lawyers and med students and police officers and firefighters. And I'm here to tell you, firefighters are the most natural collaborators. They're so funny, you guys. And they don't care what they look like in front of each other. Um, and it's not surprising to me that firefighters do such an incredible job with applied improvisation because their whole job relies on trusting each other. And so I have found, and I've worked teaching workshops all over the world. So culturally, you also see the difference between um, sort of yes and cultures and closed off fearful cultures. Uh, so I, I just, obviously, I'm hugely passionate about the power of applied improvisation um, and whether that group is a family or whether it is the UN, <laughs> like the same kind of dynamics and um, true things about like positive communication apply. Um, the using um, yes and and sort of having an open collaborative creative process is something that I've been involved in a lot in my professional life. Um, I have found that um, often when someone else sort of doesn't want to play like that, um, two constraints come up frequently, um, time and money. We want to get to a decision faster than yeah. your process would seem to allow. Um, how do you work with that? How do you push back against that? What's the what's sort of the the way of approaching someone who says, I want to get to the answer faster? I would say that if you're willing to spend the majority of your time in the blue sky, trusting that you have really smart people at your table 
So the editing, the winnowing down won't take as long. That's what I, you know, in a, in a creative, collaborative, problem solving process, I'm like, I know that you are uncomfortable with the idea of a lot of blue sky ideas, but they won't go on forever. Uh, we're going to edit, we're going to winnow down, we're going to come to consensus on what will work on time and in budget. Um, but trust me, and it is, It's a, sometimes it's trust. And if someone's not going to trust me, I'm like, high five, do it your way. And then eventually they'll end up coming back. <laughs> you know? like, uh, because I have the data, like that's something that I've learned over the years I always collect data um, so that I'm not saying to someone, only trust me, this works. I can show them these are the clients that I've had. These are the situations in which taking the time to really get a lot of ideas generated early really pays off when it comes to choosing. Um, I see a question here in the chat, Sue, um, which yeah, I think is per particularly relevant. And you you sort of touched on it a little bit already, but we are coming up into this election season. We mm -hmm. have um, a very polarized um, uh, country with people with very strongly held beliefs, um, uh, often intolerant of hearing the other side's strongly held beliefs. Um, does this... Uh, does any of the principles that you're sharing with us, does any of those suggest a way forward or a way to navigate some of that um, kind of two rock hard sides hitting each other and, and no movement in between? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, a, I think every conversation doesn't need to be about my political beliefs. <laughs> You know, and if I'm friends with someone who only can spout their political beliefs, um, I like to use my yes and to steer us toward common ground. And if I don't know that person very well, and they're just kind of out of the blue, making a very huge political statement that I don't know what to do with. My default is always, wow, I can tell that that is a, like, you really believe that. I hear it. Um, and, and what I do with that and really depends on the circumstance. Uh, if it's something that I think is hateful and I'm not comfortable having that conversation, the end by, um, if it's something that's more run of the mill, like we don't see eye to eye, yes, I hear what you're saying. I know that's important to you. And I'd love it if we could talk about what we're going to watch. I pulled up these three different choices for a movie, like if it's an extended family gathering or, um, you know, dinner mates. Yep, I hear what you're saying. And how about this chicken? Like, I'm not even, like, I'm kidding and I'm not kidding. That, like, I don't think that any of us are under any obligation to stay in conversations that are super uncomfortable. I think there are graceful ways to, um, you know, I don't need to shut somebody all the way down. I can put... Yeah. How about those cubs? Yes, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, how about those cubs? Um, yeah. I, I see in here that there are, yeah, a lot of you are asking about that. Um, you know, how do you turn a conversation to be more constructive? I I just think it's okay to come to the table with some ideas in your pocket. Uh, a friend of mine was trying to make new friends as an adult, which we all know can be really hard to do. And what he used to do was have a little note card in his front shirt pocket that had a couple of topics on there. 
And like one of the topics is like, what is a funny holiday tradition that your family has? Like, it's fine. And not just fine, it's great to come to the table, especially with people who don't know each other very well, and be a person who has the ability to bring people together just by asking a little question. Oh, Miss Coles, people hate the truth. Miss Coles. Yes, there are there is time for truth for sure. There are time for crucial conversations. I would say we just want to be able to decide for ourselves when am I going to engage in a crucial conversation? And when is this just kind of an acquaintance? And I don't really want to get into it. Uh, we we want to be able to decide that for ourselves instead of getting pulled in to something that we're not prepared for or leaving feeling like that person just walked all over me. We want to find that balance for ourselves. Um, and everybody's going to be a little different. My hope here is that these tools can at least give you, and you guys said it best, a little pause that, yes, interesting. I hear what you're saying. I'm using that pause. Uh-huh. I hear you. Oh, wow. Okay. You think aliens are living here among us. Okay. Well, I hear you. And <laughs> I, oh, oh my gosh, I think that's my phone ringing. I'm going to have to get back to you. Bye. You know, so <laughs> whatever the and is that you find mm -hmm. for yourself. Um, because not every interaction can be like, I'm going to set your clock right about the truth of the truth. Right? Yeah. Okay. So any So we have we have about uh, our audience we have about 5 more minutes so if you have some burning questions to add to the chat for Sue put them in there now. I wanted to ask you Sue um is there like a favorite or uh, maybe it's favorite is the wrong word, but um, a top of mind uh, story of when you have really bombed using mm -hmm. improv either on stage or elsewhere. Um, and then also maybe an unexpected success when you just could not have predicted how improv would go or how using these skills would solve a problem. Um, wide open, but a but a a rose and a thorn, as it were. Yes. Okay. Rose. Yes, I'm still performing, and I love it. And that is the rose for me. Is that I continue to perform, and I'll tell you, it's still kind of nerve wracking to get up in front of people and not have a script. Um, but it that's such a rose because as soon as I'm engaged, I'm not thinking about myself. One of the most beautiful things about the art form of improvisation is that my entire job, all of my energy is aimed at making you look like a rock star. Because if all my energy goes into making you look good and all your energy is going into making me look good, then we're both going to look great. And when you get really good improvisers together whose specialty is making each other look brilliant, then it's just this huge gift. And I'm not on stage thinking about myself. I'm thinking about how can I make Rebecca look like the genius that she is? How can I bring up something that has to do with transportation so John Gillen can flex his expertise? How can I you know, get some brilliant authors tied into this scene so that Shane can expound on his amazing knowledge of writers and writing? Uh, that's the real rose in improvisation. Um, and thorns, oh my God, sometimes it's so bad that I have literally left stage crawling on my hands and knees because I'm laughing so hard because we're so bad and the audience hates us so much that I just, it, it tickles me. I have crawled off stage laughing. Um, yeah, sometimes if an audience is really drunk or it's really late on a Friday night, that's when they're most mad and no one should ever go out late on a Friday night because you're just in a bad mood. Um, 
but that combined, you know, I'm sure with us goofing off sometimes makes for a terrible show. <laughs> yeah. That, that sounds in particularly the, the, the one you just described, the crawling off, that sounds like when you've attempted um, some improvisational direction and it doesn't seem like it has caught fire or gone, produced the results that you maybe were hoping for. What about just like drawing a blank? Who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? Is is that yeah. something that? I think because you're not doing stand up, you know, I always have one other person on stage with me who's going to save me. And once I like, I don't worry about that at all, ever, 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 because it's fine. And if it's silent on stage, that's fine, too. When I'm speaking, I just pretend that every slow moment is intentional. And that's part of teaching people how to see you, teaching people how to treat you. If you come running into my room and you're like, oh my God, there's this insane situation. If I respond with calm, I can act differently than I feel. And I need to do that on stage all the time. And when we do that in our lives, act differently than we feel, we can stay connected even when things are extremely hairy or unpredictable. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I, I, um, I don't I want to just quick questions about me. Yuck. Let's stop this. <laughs> I'm just going to quickly check the chat to see if there's right. anything outstanding here. Um, it looks like we are pretty good. Sue, I want to thank you so much. Um, I love this. I love getting a chance to catch up with you and reconnect. Um, this uh, audience, dear audience, is the part that's not going to be improv because I do have some words I must say. Um, once again, this has been another Levy lecture made possible by the Levy Senior Center Foundation and the city of Evanston. As always, we appreciate your support of the foundation as we continue working to connect our community of older adults. Um, thank you all. Thank you, volunteers. Thank you, audience members. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. And um, one last thing, everybody. This will be up on YouTube relatively uh, soon. So if you have friends and family members that missed it uh, or you just want to revisit it, you can find it there. So Beautiful. long, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. And bye. thank you, volunteers. Great volunteering. You're amazing improvisers, each and every one of you. Bye.